This Boeing 747 is on final approach into Manas International Airport in Kyrgyzstan. The aircraft is working perfectly and the pilots are following the ILS approach, getting ready to execute a normal outer land due to the very thick fog. But are they really? A very little known feature within the 747's autopilot logic is about to put these two pilots to the test very soon. Stay tuned. On the 15th of January 2017, a flight crew consisting of four pilots working for ACT Airlines had been planned to operate two flights on a wet lease contract on behalf of Turkish Cargo. The first flight with callsign Turkish Cargo 6491 would start in Hong Kong and then proceed to Manas Airport in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, where there would be a crew change and then the last flight would continue towards Ataturk Airport in Istanbul, Turkey. Prior to the flights, the pilots had enjoyed a pretty long rest period of 69 hours in Hong Kong, which they had spent in a hotel in the city, meaning that they were well rested when they found themselves on the bus going out to the airport in the evening of the planned flights. Even though there were four pilots scheduled for this duty, only two of them were actually going to operate the first flight. The remaining two were traveling passive for the first leg and would then be taking over for the second flight to Istanbul. The captain who was going to operate the first flight was a 59-year-old Turkish national with little over 10,800 hours of total time. He had only been operating on the Boeing 747-400 for about 820 hours at the time of this flight, and all of those hours had been flown as pilot in command. His background prior to flying civilian airliners was in the Turkish Air Force, just like his colleague that he was about to share the cockpit with, a 59-year-old first officer. The first officer was also quite experienced, with around 5,900 hours of total time and 1,758 of those flown on the 747. The pilots had flown together before, so they knew each other well enough to just go straight into the pre-flight planning as soon as they arrived to the airport. The aircraft that they were going to fly was a 14-year-old Boeing 747-412 freighter, which had no recorded technical problems on it. The only items mentioned in the tech log were a few dents here and there, and they were all within safe limits for operation. Once the captain had verified that, the pilots turned their attention to the weather, which looked like it was going to be a little bit more tricky for the first flight. The en route weather was fine, but a cold front had passed over the area of Bishkek, bringing very cold air and freezing frontal fog with it. This fog was forecasted to bring the visibility down to 200 meters with vertical visibility as low as 100 feet at their destination during the night and around the time of their planned arrival. But it was forecasted to start getting better around 0600 on the following day. Manas Airport was equipped with a Category 2 approach system. I'll explain what that is soon. But even with that, the visibility was actually so poor that the airport couldn't really be used as a planned destination. Fortunately, the two alternates, Astana and Karaganda, were quite a bit better and had mainly mist and light snowfall, so the flight was still legal to dispatch, even though the pilots both knew that the approach into their destination might become quite challenging. Anyway, that didn't really matter. We pilots often have to start flights towards destination with marginal weather, providing that we have at least two alternates who are working. In the worst case scenario, this will mean that we might have to divert, but in the vast majority of cases, a Category 2 ILS will bring us down so close to the runway that we will be able to land safely, even in very dense fog. So the pilots continued with checking the NOTAMs, deciding on their departure fuel of 96,640 kilos for their six hour long trip over to Manas, and once they were done, they walked out to the aircraft and started prepping it for departure. Now, because the arrival weather was expected to be so marginal, the captain decided that he would be pilot flying for the flight since that's what the ACT airline's manual dictated. Now, this is a bit different than the way that we, in my airline, operate in weather like this. We always elect the first officer to be pilot flying if we see that there's a possibility that a Cat 2 or Cat 3 approach would be flown. And the reason for that is that we fly these approaches as monitored approaches, meaning that the first officer will operate the aircraft down to the minima and also through a possible missed approach, but the captain will take controls if enough visual references can be seen at the minima. This is a very good way of utilizing the crew, and it also means that the captain can be looking outside, searching for the approach light, and will therefore not have to transfer from scanning onto the instruments to outside references if a landing will be made. 
But for some reason, this is not the way that ACT Airlines did it. Instead, the captain would be flying the approach, waiting for the first officer to tell him if he saw anything outside, and if he did, the captain would then transfer from his instrument, start looking outside, and decide if they could land or not before they reach the minima. This technique will end up having some serious consequences in the story, but we'll get to that. As the pilots were preparing the aircraft for departure, there was some delay to the loading of their cargo into the main cargo hold. This meant that when the pilots could finally ask for push and start at time 1912, they were more than two hours delayed. This in turn would mean that they would now have to operate until at least around 0200 in the morning, approaching the window of circadian low. The taxi out, takeoff and initial climb from Hong Kong was completely uneventful. The captain engaged the autopilot at around 400 feet and then continued their climb up to the cruise altitude of flight level 340, which is around 34,000 feet. The flight then proceeded normally until about two hours before the landing when the captain handed over the controls to the first officer, started setting up for the approach and preparing for his approach briefing. And this approach briefing and what the captain decided to include but also to omit from it will turn out to be very important for what's about to happen and I will tell you all about that after this. As I was working on the script for today's video I was trying to find some newspaper articles and reports from the accident but I kept getting slowed down by blocked websites. But then I remembered that I could use today's sponsor NordVPN to unlock those articles since Nord services are specifically designed to break down those type of digital borders just like that. And Nord does more than just assisting digital access. They also work as a kind of shield in the digital world. Their cutting edge cybersecurity features, which by the way goes far beyond just a normal VPN, are designed to help you stave off hackers, malware and those annoying phishing attempts. So whether you would just like some help to access more international research material, watch your favorite shows abroad, or just keep your data more safe, NordVPN has your back. Now, if you click on the link here below, which is nordvpn.com slash pilot, you will both support my work and unlock four free months whenever you subscribe to a two year plan. Also, remember that you can test NordVPN completely risk free due to their 30 day money back guarantee. Thank you Nord, now let's continue the story. So unfortunately, the cockpit voice recorder started its recording a bit after the captain had already started his briefing. But from the content of it, the investigators could still derive that he most likely did not discuss the different distances versus altitude checks indicated on the ILS approach chart. The most important of those would have been the final approach point, where the aircraft latest needed to have intercepted the ILS glide slope, providing that they were maintaining the correct altitude. That point was located at a 3.2 nautical miles distance from a VUR called Manas and at an altitude of 3,400 feet. But since the two navigational receivers were both going to be tuned to the ILS frequency, which was different from the VUR, it's unsure if this VUR station was tuned during the actual approach. In any case, those same distances were clearly marked in the navigational database, which the pilot had programmed into their flight management's computer, so they would be able to see them on their navigation display, but like I said, this was never mentioned in the brief. Now, when the captain started his brief, they were still too far away from the airport to receive the actual weather, but the captain based his briefing on the forecasted weather, which indicated that runway 26 would likely be in use. His briefing included the anticipated weather, which was foggy, the no-tums that could affect them, and the type of approach they were going to fly, in this case a fully automatic Category 2 ILS approach followed by an autoland. He also talked about the minimum sector altitudes for terrain clearance and the vertical profile for the approach, this is where he didn't talk about the check heights, as well as which minimums they were going to use, which in this case was set to 100 feet radio altitude. He continued with explaining the missed approach point and what to do in case they had to fly the missed approach procedure. And on top of these items, which are standard in any approach briefing, the captain also explained the differences in procedures between flying a fully automatic approach, like the one they were going to do, and a normal approach. This included how he would deal with the autopilot system and what to do in case certain failures would arise. Now the final report contains the cockpit conversation, translated from Turkish to English, which means that it's not perfect. But when it came to discussing the different failures that might arise, the captain said, If I see the runway lights, I will call landing. And if I don't, I will call go around. And also, if any emergency occurs above and below 1000 feet, let's say we get an autopilot no land 3 or 
no land above 1000 feet, or if we get an autopilot or no auto land at all, we will execute a go around. He then continued, if the autopilot disconnects, we will try to re-engage. Um, if it happens below 1000 feet above touchdown zone, we will again go around. And if we get ILS deviation below 1000 feet, we will do a go around due to ILS deviation. Now, that might have sounded a little bit messy, which, like I said, probably had to do with the translation, but it is clearly indicating that the captain was planning to do a go-around for almost any issue once the aircraft had passed below 1,000 feet on approach. Remember that. At this point, it's probably also worth explaining a bit about the approach that these pilots were about to fly. An ILS approach is by far the most common type of approach that we use for instrument arrivals. It works by two sets of antennas on the ground, the localizer and glide slope, sending out lobes of radio signals at two different frequencies, which are then being sensed by the instruments on board the aircraft. Now, depending on how those lobes interfere with each other, the instruments will then be able to sense if the localizer centerline is right or left of the aircraft, or if the glide slope is above or below. This type of approach is extremely accurate, and in the case of a standard category 1 ILS, it can guide an aircraft down to a height of around 200 feet above the ground. From that height, the pilot flying must see enough of the approach and runway environments to be able to safely maneuver the aircraft down to a manual landing. But there are also category 2 and category 3 ILS approaches. These work essentially in the same way, but are only used during low visibility conditions like fog and have quite a few additional requirements on them. These include more separation between aircraft taking off and landing, a wider area around the antennas which needs to be safeguarded, and there are also increased requirements on backup electrical power at the airport. Now, when pilots fly category 2 or 3 ILS approaches, they are almost always flown using the aircraft's autoland function. This means that the aircraft will handle the actual landing itself with the pilots only monitoring its performance and the pilot flying will then take over at some point after touchdown. That in turn means that both the aircraft, pilots and airport needs to be certified to operate these type of approaches and we pilots are checked on our abilities to do this every six months normally. Now to make it even more complicated but adding a super important detail for what's about to happen, the aircraft that are certified to fly category 2 and 3 approaches can do so either in a fail operational or fail passive way. If the aircraft's autopilot system is fail passive, like it is in the Boeing 737 fleet that I fly, the two autopilots would both independently couple with the ILS and start flying the approach down towards the runway. But if any of those autopilots would then suddenly start telling the aircraft that it should, for example, start a turn, but the other autopilot would not indicate the same, well then the system would not know which of the autopilots is correct, and the whole system would just disengage. And with the autopilots disengaged, an immediate missed approach will then have to be flown. But if the aircraft is fail operational, internal components will allow the aircraft to continue to fly the approach even if a failure would be sensed. In the case of the Boeing 747-400, it was equipped with three autopilots, which allowed it to be fail operational, and therefore continue flying the automatic approach even if certain failures would occur. So the captain now finished up his approach briefing, and soon after that the aircraft started approaching its planned top of descent. The pilots completed the descent checklist, and at the time 51 minutes past midnight, the first officer called up Bishkek Control and requested their first descent. They were initially cleared to descend to flight level 220, which is about 22,000 feet. And at that point, the flight was about 131 miles to the east of Manas VOR, over an area with very high mountains. The captain initiated the descent using the LNAV and VNAV autopilot modes, meaning that the aircraft was now following its pre-programmed tracking path down towards the airport. But like I said, there was a lot of high mountains below them, so the 22,000 feet restriction had been assigned to them to keep them clear of that terrain. As they were descending, the air traffic controller called the crew up to update them on the latest weather information for their destination. He told them that runway 26 was in use, just as they had planned, and that the runway visual range, which is a way to measure visibility, was 400 meters in the beginning of the runway and 325 meters in the center and end part. On top of that, the vertical visibility was reported as 130 feet. So, this was not great, but largely in line with what the pilots were already expecting, and it was also over the minimum visibility of 350 meters in the touchdown zone required to start the approach. 
About seven minutes after the descent had started, the aircraft leveled off at flight level 220 and the autopilot went into altitude hold. The flight management computer almost always calculates with a continuous idle descent from when the descent starts, so this level off meant that they were now becoming higher and higher on profile, which is not uncommon in areas of high terrain. The pilots were flying in clear air at this point, so they could clearly see the mountains peeking up through the clouds below, which they also commented on. After a short while, the controller again called them up and repeated the same visibility and weather information as they got before. The first officer confirmed that he had received the information the first time and, on the captain's instruction, requested further descent. But the controller just told them to maintain flight over 220 until further notice, because there were still mountains below them. At this point, the cockpit voice recorder started picking up some slight agitation from the captain. It is likely that he was looking down on his navigation display and saw that he was getting higher and higher on the profile and that he didn't like that. He told the first officer that at 66 miles from the airport, they would absolutely need further descent. That corresponds with three times his altitude, which is a common way that we use to manually calculate how many track miles we need for descent. Now, a trick that can be used if you find yourself in a situation like this is to start lowering the speed. And that's because the total energy state of the aircraft is a combination of the potential energy, which is altitude, and kinetic energy, which is your speed. So, if you're getting high on altitude, well, then you can start to slow down to offset that a bit. And when you then get a bigger descent clearance later on, you can just drop the nose and let the aircraft pick up that speed, and hopefully you will then be back close to your profile. But the captain didn't do this, and to be totally honest, at this point he still had a lot of track miles left, so there would be many other ways that he could fix it. He now told the first officer to again ask for descent, and this time they were clear to descend to flight level 180 and to maintain that level until at least an Arnav point called Raksat. Now, according to their chart, the minimum altitude to keep over that point for terrain clearance was flight level 170, so this just further irritated the captain, who thought that the controller was keeping them high on purpose. But in reality, the reason the controller had given them 1,000 feet extra here was because the temperature in the area was very cold. Cold air will take up less volume than warm air, so when the temperature is very low, an aircraft will actually be closer to the terrain than it will be in warmer temperatures. This means that the minimum terrain clearance altitudes must be corrected for this temperature, so that's exactly what the controller was actually doing. When the aircraft again leveled off, the area controller told the crew to switch over to Bishkek approach controller, and the crew quickly did so. But as they were changing the frequency, they were both also muttering some underhanded comments about that previous controller. So why is the fact that they did that so important? Well, because it shows that the pilots, especially the captain, was likely starting to feel the onset of some stress here. Maybe because of the delay to the flight, or being kept above the profile, and possibly also due to some onsetting fatigue. The problem is that this kind of mindset can lead into something we know as get there itis, which basically means that the pilots will be more go-minded than they should, and therefore potentially miss important clues that should lead them to take other decisions. Anyway, once the first officer checked in with the approach controller, they had already overflown Raksat, so they were now clear to the center flight level 60 and proceed via the Toppa 1 arrival for the ILS approach runway 26. This was exactly what they had planned for, and the approach chart showed a minimum altitude of flight level 60 by Tokpa. But again, this clearance seemed to irritate the captain, who muttered, They left us high again! At this point, the aircraft was flying significantly higher than it should be, but he was now clear to descend 12,000 feet unrestricted, so here the captain had a great chance to get back on that profile. That would, however, require him to react quickly and increase drag by immediately selecting speed brakes and possibly also increasing the speed to get that descent rate going. But he didn't do any of this. Instead, he initially just selected level change and reduced the thrust to idle, maintaining the speed at around 260 knots. He also told the first officer that he was planning to be flight level 60 by Topka. Now, Topka was only about 27 nautical miles away at this point, and like I told you, they had about 12,000 feet to descend. So with the formula that we talked about earlier, three times required descent will give you the track miles, you can see that 12 times 3 is actually 36. This meant that 27 miles was way too close to achieve what he was planning to do, unless he took some immediate actions to correct it.
this is exactly the kind of calculations that we pilots constantly have to do to make sure that we have the descent planning under control whenever we are flying. The captain must have gradually understood this as well because he soon started to increase the speed gradually up towards 280 knots but that was still too little. The aircraft now entered into a cloud layer which was stretching all the way down to the ground. The temperature outside was well below freezing so the pilots now had to switch on the engine and wing anti-ice. And that also had a negative effect on their descent performance since the engines had to spool up a bit to provide the extra bleed air needed for the anti-ice systems and that meant that the descent rate now decreased even more. The captain kept gradually increasing the speed and at times 0108 and 20 seconds the first officer reported that the ILS frequencies were now tuned and identified, meaning that the navigational system was now set up and ready for the coming approach. The captain continued to try to get back onto the profile but he was still not using his speed brakes, instead he switched over the autopilot to vertical speed mode and increased that to 2400 feet per minute. At the same time he decreased the speed selected to 280 knots but since the aircraft in vertical speed mode will prioritize the vertical speed as the name suggests the speed just kept increasing to 317 knots. Now below 10,000 feet the speed restriction in almost all places is 250 knots and that was also the SOP in ACT airlines but the captain now told the first officer that he would disregard this and maintain hind speed below 10,000 feet instead, at least to start with. Now in controlled airspace you can get ATC approval to do this and it's not a big deal, but in this case it was a sign that the aircraft was not in a good energy state and this would become a bigger and bigger problem as they now started to get closer and closer to the approach. So what could they have done instead? Well. Here there are several ways to deal with this. Like I mentioned before, early use of speed brakes and high speed can often help if you are far out. But as you're starting to get closer to the approach, you often have to do the complete opposite, which is to slow the aircraft right down. Now if you do that, it will momentarily put you even higher above the profile, but it will also enable you to select flaps and even possibly extend the landing gear to increase the overall drag even though using the landing gear is a bit extreme. But with flaps and speed brakes selected at a lower speed, your vertical speed might not be as high, but your descent per nautical mile will be higher, which is actually what you need as you're getting closer. Now, after you have tried this, if you still see that it's not enough, well, then the only right thing to do is request a holding pattern or delaying vectors. That might feel irritating and delay you a few minutes, but it's always worth it, trust me. But these two pilots instead kept pressing on, and as they passed 12,200 feet, the captain finally started extending his speed brakes. About one minute later, 250 knots was also selected on the MCP, and the descent mode went back into level change. This meant that the aircraft now started reducing the speed after all, but by doing that, it also reduced its vertical speed. At this point, the approach controller called them up with a weather update for the crew. The RVR had now dropped to 300 meters in the touchdown zone, which was less than the 350 meters they needed, but they were still allowed to start the approach and continue down to 1000 feet, hoping that the RVR would improve, and if not, obviously they would then have to do a go-around. Now this provision meant that when the approach controller asked them if they were still happy to continue, they answered that they were. If they would have taken the decision to go into a halt here instead, this story would have had a very different ending. At time 01, 11 and 18 seconds, the aircraft passed the Tokpa point at an altitude of 9,200 feet. That's 3,200 feet higher than the captain had planned with. A few seconds later, an autopilot caution annunciation was triggered. Now, this had to do with a temporary trimming issue in one of the flight control computers and it quickly disappeared, but it was never called out by any of the crew. This fault will have no bearing on what's about to happen, but the fact that it wasn't noticed or called out by the crew also might be a sign that the pilots were starting to get a little bit distracted. The controller now cleared the crew for the ILS approach and asked them to report when established on the localizer. He also told them that the transition level was flight level 60 and below that they would need to fly at an altimeter setting of QNH 1023 hectopascal. This was read back by the first officer and the altimeters were then changed over by both pilots. They were still at 8300 feet at this point with only 12.5 nautical miles to go, that's about half the track miles that you would really need, so the situation was starting to get really bad. The speed 
had now reduced back to 250 knots, so the captain called for flaps 1 to be selected. He then reduced the speed further to 240 knots and asked for flaps 5, and this was a really reasonable thing to do, like I explained before. He told the first officer to request further descent, and when he did, they were told to descend to 3,400 feet, which was the lowest altitude that they could get before capturing the glide slope. The captain selected that new altitude on the mode control panel, and he then asked the first officer to start running through the approach checklist. At time 01, 13 and 28 seconds, the aircraft flew past a guide point located on the radial 090 degrees and 8 nautical miles away from Manas VOR. This point was the last point on the arrival before turning in towards the localizer, and it was designed to be passed at a minimum of 4,400 feet. The aircraft passed that point at 6,500 feet, a full 2,100 feet higher than the minimum, and with a speed of 220 knots. The captain asked for flaps 10 to be selected, and when the first officer reached over to select it, he also said, speed checks, flaps 10, um, we might end up a bit high here, and we have speed as well clearly showing some discomfort with the situation. The captain did not respond to this prompt by the first officer, and the first officer didn't mention his concerns anymore after this. The aircraft now continued towards the localizer, and the captain kept the speed brakes extended, even though that was not recommended above flaps 5 to avoid buffeting. This shows that the captain likely was well aware of the problematic height, but he still did not extend the landing gear, which could have possibly helped here. Instead, he armed the localizer mode, making the autopilot ready to capture it, and at time 01, 14 and 5 seconds, the localizer beam was indeed captured and the aircraft started turning towards the runway. They were now only 6.1 nautical miles away from the touchdown, with an altitude around 5,700 feet and a speed of 200 knots, still desperately high. The first officer called out, localizer captured, to which the captain responded, approach mode selected. This meant that the autopilot would now be primed to capture the glide slope as well, but the problem was that the 3 degrees glide slope that they were actually aiming for was now situated well below them. Now, it is possible to capture a glide slope from above, but you have to be very careful if you're going to do that. Because of the nature of how radio signals are transmitted, they will often bounce against the ground as well as being transmitted in the intended direction, and this will create false glide slopes at regular intervals. The most common ones are set at 6 and 9 degrees from the transmitter, stretching above the correct glide slope, and the autopilot will not be able to distinguish between the correct glide slope and a false one. Because of that, we normally never arm the approach mode unless we are capturing the glide slope from below or we are within one dot of the glide slope from above and the altitude makes sense. Anyway, the aircraft was now barreling forward towards the runway, still well above the glide. The autopilot was operating with the localizer captured, giving it lateral guidance and level change, descending it down to 3,400 feet as cleared. When they passed 5.4 miles from the VOR, the captain finally asked for gear down to be selected. He now had only 2.2 miles to lose almost 2,000 feet in order to reach the glide slope intercept point at 3.2 miles at the correct altitude. The speed was reduced to 190 knots, flaps 20 was selected and the speed brakes were finally retracted. The GPWS now called out 2500 showed that the radio altimeter had started sensing the ground below them and when he heard that the first officer responded check. But the captain didn't respond, even though the low visibility procedures required him to do that. This was yet another sign that he was now possibly getting task saturated. Now remember we talked before about getteritis? Well, this was a prime example of that. The captain was now focusing all of his attention on getting the aircraft down to the glide slope, when the much easier decision would have been to just tell the controller that they were too high, level the aircraft off at the missed approach altitude, and then just fly the missed approach. That would have taken maybe a few minutes extra and been a bit of a hassle for sure, but the aircraft would then have been in a much better position and they could have done a relaxed and perfectly normal ILS after that. They had plenty of fuel, so that wasn't a problem, and they were also the only aircraft in the area. It's exactly in situations like this that the pilot monitoring plays such a super important role in being that voice of calm and sanity advocating for decisions like this to be made, but that sadly didn't happen. Instead followed a discussion between the two pilots, which will have very dire consequences. The captain said, look, 
Actually, you can see the ground down there, likely seeing an opening in the fog below them. The first officer responded, well, I'm monitoring the instruments, as he rightfully should be, but to that the captain responded, instruments? I monitor the instruments, you look outside. And the first officer responded in agreement to that. Now, I cannot overemphasize how important that discussion was. The captain likely said this because he wanted to get an early indication of any runway or approach lights in sight so he could take a decision to land, but what he was effectively doing was to remove the pilot monitoring from his monitoring role and having him stare out into the dark fog instead. Anyway, the aircraft had now reached a distance of 3.2 miles from the VOR, which is where the glide slope needed to be captured in order for them to continue the approach. But they were still at 4,000 feet, meaning a good 600 feet above the glide slope, and that meant that the glide slope indicator showed full deflection down and likely wasn't even moving. Like I mentioned before, the mandatory checkpoints, like the final approach fix, was supposed to be verbally called out and verified to watch the altitude, but that had not been covered in the approach briefing before, so it was now completely missed. Instead, the aircraft just continued to descend down towards 3,400 feet, now with little to no chance to be able to actually capture that glide slope, at least not the correct one. Apart from having failed to fly the approach accurately, this was still not so bad, or even dangerous at this point. If they would have recognized their situation, they could have just abandoned the approach, done a go-around and then proceeded for another one. But since they didn't, things would now start to take a very sinister turn. The captain was aware that he was flying above profile, but he blamed that almost completely on the controllers and now started to scream about them and even calling them names. The first officer tried to calm him down by pointing out that nothing has really happened here. The captain just muttered in response and then asked for flaps 25 to be selected as the aircraft continued its gradual descent moving closer and closer to the runway. The pilots had at this point forgotten to report that they had captured the localizer, so the approach controller now called them up and asked them to confirm that they were established. The first officer responded and confirmed that they were, because the localizer had been captured, but he didn't mention the glide slope. This confirmation prompted the approach controller to ask the crew to change over to the tower controller frequency, and he never asked them to confirm that they were fully established. Now you might wonder, why didn't the controller, at least at some point during the arrival, ask the crew about their high altitude or try to warn them? Well, as it turns out, even though the controller could see the aircraft's altitude on his radar screens, his responsibility was to make sure that they didn't descend too low and cross any minimum altitudes. The descent profile which the aircraft was keeping above those minimum altitudes was left completely up to the pilots. The first officer now checked in with the tower, who now cleared Turkish cargo 6941 to land runway 26. The surface wind was calm and the RVR was now 400 meters, which was above their minimum visibility, meaning that the crew could now legally continue the approach. But the problem was, of course, that without having captured the glide slope, the aircraft now instead leveled off at 3400 feet, still with the glide slope armed and ready for capture. They passed the outer marker beacon, which was another possible point to verify the correct altitude without anyone saying anything. Instead, at times 1, 15 and 50 seconds, the aircraft was still maintaining level flight at 3,400 feet with only 0.4 nautical miles to go to the VUR. Here, as the first officer was responding to the landing clearance, the captain asked for flaps 30, which was the planned landing flaps. Since the first officer didn't immediately respond, the captain likely reached out and selected it himself, and as he was doing so, the glide slope pointer suddenly started moving. Now remember how I was telling you about false glide slopes? Yes, the aircraft had now flown close enough to the glide slope antenna that it was in range for the 9 degree false glide slope. The autopilot now quickly captured it and started pitching the aircraft down with a vertical speed of around 1400 feet per minute. If the pilots would have monitored their distance here, they would have realized the absurdity of this capture. But remember, the nav frequencies were both set to the ILS, so the distance from the DME was likely not even displayed. But in any case, if they would have looked at their navigation displays, they should have seen that they were now practically already over the runway. And here is where the design of the Boeing 747's fail operational autopilot system starts playing an important role in this story. About six seconds after the glide slope capture, the land three annunciation was shown, meaning that all three autopilots were now ready to fly the planned outer land. The pilots saw this and the first officer called out, glide stop captured. 
to which the captain responded, check, 4,400 feet set, as he set the missed approach altitude in the MCP. At this stage, the pilot should have completed the landing checklist, but for some reason, this was never done. The aircraft was now overflying the runway below and the glide slope antenna next to it, but the signal from the ILS was still being received. It was, however, fluctuating all over the plates, with deviations far in excess of one dot, which is the maximum deviation allowed on an ILS during normal circumstances. But curiously, it seems like this glide slope indication was not even being monitored by anyone at this point. Now remember the first officer had been told to look outside, so that's likely what he was doing, and the captain might have just concentrated on the aircraft descent performance, which was, curiously, close to flawless. Normally, an aircraft which is trying to follow a glide slope, which is moving all over the place, would be pitching up and down like a bucking bronco, but this aircraft was descending nice and gently down, along something that looked and felt pretty much like a 3 degrees glide slope. So how was that possible? Well. Remember how I told you about the fail operational system in the 747? The system that allowed an approach to be continued even if a fault would be detected? Well, it turns out that this system also had a built-in feature for unreliable glide slope signals. So, in case the glide slope signal would momentarily disappear, the system would revert to flying a calculated 3 degree inertial path based on the aircraft's inertial reference system. This path would then be followed until the glide stop signal was either re-established or all the way down to an automatic landing. And the land 3 or land 2 renunciations would continue to be displayed throughout. But of course, this wouldn't happen without any type of cautions. So about 15 seconds after the glide slope capture, as the aircraft descended through around 1,000 feet over the ground, an autopilot caution ACAS message appeared together with two master caution lights. The FMA glide slope annunciation also got an amber line through it, the flight director bars were removed, and all of this was accompanied by an oral warning consisting of four beeps in a row, which could be heard several times after this. None of this was noticed or called out by any of the pilots, and since the autopilots continued to fly the now completely unguided approach, the aircraft just kept descending. This is a bit hard to explain, since the captain had briefed that any glide slope deviations below 1000 feet, as well as any warnings, should result in an immediate go around. But such is unfortunately the nature of the human mind. When we get into a decision tunnel, it's sometimes very hard to see outside of it. And then, at times 0, 1, 16 and 18 seconds, the armed automatic landing mode suddenly changed from land 3 to land 2, and this was called out by the captain. This fact likely gives us a clue about where the captain was focusing his attention, but unfortunately, the ACT Airlines procedures still allowed for an outer land approach to continue with that particular degradation. This meant that the aircraft continued its approach, now overflying the over 4 km long runway, whilst the crew were happily calling out the radio altitudes as they passed them. Both the aircraft and the first officer called out 500, to which the captain responded, continue. And very soon after that, the GPWS started calling out Glide Slope, which was repeated Glide five slope. times, again with no reaction from the crew. Glide slope. Now, this I find really, really hard to understand. A Glide Slope oral warning means that the aircraft is deviating more than 1.3 dots from the Glide Slope, and in the context of a low visibility outer land approach below 1000 feet, this should always mean a go around. But that's not what happened, and the only explanation is that the captain was suffering from some kind of extremely severe confirmation bias, based on the land 2 indication which is still so in front of him, maybe coupled with gateritis and possibly onsetting fatigue. In any case, the glide slope warning eventually disappeared as the aircraft descended below 200 feet radio, which was the lowest threshold for that particular warning. All other GPWS warnings were also muted at this point, as the aircraft was in the immediate airport vicinity and the system therefore interpreted as in the landing zone. At 150 feet, the first officer called out, approaching minimums, and at that stage the aircraft had already overflown the whole runway and was now heading towards a small village on the other side. The captain again responded by telling the first officer to look outside, followed by the aircraft calling out 100. This was the category 2 minimums, but it still took the first officer a further 2 seconds to call out minimums, to which the captain responded, negative, go around, and then finally pushed the toga buttons. But that final delay to the minimums call turned out to be the last link in this terrible error chain. The last one in a long row of missed opportunities to regain safe flight.
By waiting those two seconds with calling out minimums, the aircraft had continued to descend even further to a height of only 58 feet. And with a landing weight of almost 275 tons, it was very hard to turn all of that inertia around and get the aircraft climbing again. The giant engine started spooling up and the nose started rising, but it was just too late. About three seconds after the toga buttons were pushed, the aircraft touched down about 930 meters beyond the landing runway at a speed of 165 knots, and it then bounced off slightly. The right wing impacted trees just prior to the touchdown, which severely damaged it. And only seconds later, the landing gear and inboard engine slammed into a concrete barrier, which formed part of the airport perimeter wall. That collision then led to a second touchdown, which also coincided with the right wing impacting several buildings in the village just beyond the airport perimeter. Those impacts yawed the whole body of the aircraft over to the right and then caused it to start rolling as the wings detached, destroying more than 30 buildings as it eventually disintegrated and burst into flames. All four people on board were immediately killed, as well as 35 people living in the village. Remember, this all happened in the middle of the night. The rescue personnel attended as quickly as they could, but there was very little they could do. The main cause of the accident was found to be the lack of monitoring by the accident crew, compounded by bad weather at the airport. It was impossible to determine why the pilots didn't respond to all the warnings they received, other than the fact that psycho-emotional factors must have played a role, as we discussed earlier. The investigation also pointed some fingers towards Boeing because even though the aircraft had performed exactly as designed, the investigators felt that the complete loss of GlideStop signal should have triggered a more unambiguous warning rather than a caution to snap the crew out of their decision tunnel and hopefully force a go-around. Several recommendations were issued as a result of this accident, and if you're interested in reading them, I have created a link to them in the description below. And for those of you who are in my Patreon crew, we can discuss it in our next Hangout. Have an absolutely fantastic day, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.